Fading that out now and ready to get started. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. How's everybody doing on this fine Monday? Hi there. Hey. Fantastically. We remind me, why are we doing this on Mondays again? <laughs> because you're right. Them this way, drill sergeant. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. It was, it was your idea. That's yeah. of course. Hello and welcome to another episode of Office Hours where we'll be discussing all things Microsoft 365 and answering questions from the community. Uh, my name is Christian Buckley. I'm an Office Apps and Services MVP and Microsoft Regional Director. And I'm also the Microsoft Go-To-Market Director at Avpoint. And joining me on screen so far today, uh, Mr. Eric Riz, founder and CEO of MT Cubicle and an Office Apps and Services MVP based out of Toronto, Canada, our uh, 51st state up north. Thank Welcome. <laughs> Uh, we also have uh, Mike Nelson, a solution architect with Pure Storage, and a cloud and data center management MVP based in Appleton, Wisconsin. And Hal Hostetler, senior field engineer with Roland Shore and Tower in Tucson, Arizona, and always bragging about how much nicer the weather is down there until July, August time frame. Then we all must pity him. And he's also an office apps and services MVP. And uh, he now he needs to take his personal call. So unprofessional. Wow. Answer wow. your phone, Fletch. <laughs> um, so, I, so I believe we have Sean joining us soon. I don't know what happened to to, to Sean, but I, I actually have it on good authority that Mr. McDonough is unable to join us today. Yes, yeah, uh, nice. Okay, an email. All right. Well, well, there we go. Well, we might have some other folks jumping in. Um, who knows? If not, well, I've queued up all of these SharePoint questions that Michael just have to handle on his own. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, what else is going on? Any any huge news? I mean, anything from the message center, Mike, that's like huge? That's like huge. It's all huge, Christian. Yeah. Uh, it's, <laughs> <laughs> would you like me to run through my list? Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's uh, let's right. kick things off. Yeah. Let's do this. Um, so the first one is from the let's add more confusion to our feature naming department at Microsoft. Um, they have now taken tasks by planner and to do the name, and it is now shortened to just tasks within Teams. So uh, I don't know whose bright idea it was to call something tasks by planner and to do, um, but now they've come down to their senses and they're just calling it tasks. Not to be confused with like, the 20 other apps that they have tasks uh, in, um, but this one is specifically around Teams. So I'm, I'm assuming that next it's just going to be reduced to the capital T. It very well could be, yeah. yeah. It, Actually, uh, I believe that's reserved for the logo on your shirt, Mr. Buckley. Ah. Uh, yeah, that's true. I, but... I believe I've seen that particular character somewhere before. Oh, wait, there it is right there. <laughs> there you go. All right, uh, moving on to uh, Teams. You can now create tasks from Teams chats or channel posts. I don't know if anybody knew that, but that's coming, um, where you'll be able to actually take and create a task from something in a chat. You'll be able to right click on a, on a chat or hit that little um, uh, three button uh, thing on a chat and be able the to- ellipses. The ellipses. Yeah, well, it's not really an ellipses. It is a bit it's of- It's the ellipses. vertical ellipses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the and then you'll be able waffle. to- it's like a bite yeah. of waffle. Is that what right. that is? Yeah. Right, right, right. And you'll be able to create a task from that uh, or any channel post, you know, um, and you can do that. But until task gets renamed, you'll actually have task by planner and to do is what you'll have to check. But uh, that's kind of cool. Mike, do you know if that's task task? Because I know now you can you can push work to an, an Azure board. If, what was that again? You can create a work item. Not a for task. A, for Azure DevOps? Or is there something else entirely? 
for Azure Boards, as in oh, the application. Azure. Yeah, and Azure Boards is part of Azure DevOps. Yeah. Right. Right. So this is just putting it into a personal task list or my tasks or a collaborative task list for the team. So it seems to be pretty specific to, you know, teams. Although, if you think about it, it's being added to planner tests, right? So whatever you can do with planner tests, I'm assuming you can do with that test. Correct. Yeah. This, you know, I mean, look, we know it's evolving. There's more to go. Uh, I'm. I didn't know about the uh, Azure Boards integration, so that's yeah. great because that's been a huge request. Is being able to see that cross-platform capability. I'd love to see them make some announcements about Project for the Web. Um, yeah. Somebody yeah. still uses that? Oh, okay. Yeah, there's still people that are out there. There's still Project MVPs, but yeah. it was. But again, you're going to have that out there. But like to your point, I, that's valid. If if it's not integrated with the other tools then you know i mean the reality is for people that are professional project managers planner and even devops don't have the features don't have the capabilities that you need in the desktop or project for the web in fact project for the web doesn't have the capabilities that the project ms project desktop app have and, right well i mean and to my point is you can make you can create tasks in OneNote as an example but does that tie back to the same type of tasks in Teams? No. Not yeah, not fully. Yeah. And and that's right. yeah, yeah. You almost you almost need to have that ability. There needs to be like a tasks uh, a module in OneNote and you know a anywhere else that you're going to have as a you know creation of tasks. I'd say an Outlook is another example where things happen and you want a, a, a you know a certain percentage of of AI capabilities to automatically identify and is this a task? Do you want to create a task? You can do some of that now, but to be able to push it to the relevant location, like right. a planner board, a DevOps board, yeah. just a to-do personal to-do list, whatever that is. Right, right. Okay, well, now that Christian has taken up most of my time, Mr. Chairman, I reclaim my time. You have as um, much time as you need, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, as always, I yield my time to you. So please okay. speak freely. Uh, Point this of one. order. Point of order. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, this one comes from the someone at Microsoft is wondering if anyone notices department. Um, <laughs> okay. This is the from the M365 Defender threat protection status report will take over as a standard reporting email now. So you used to be able to do like safe attachment, safe uh, safe attachment message. Uh, malware detected and a spam detection report, all separate reports. Well, now they're being all put into the threat protection status report. Can anybody tell me anything they notice about that name at all? No, not getting it. It sounds like a trick question. Well, what it is, it's what you if you take the report, I mean, you're getting a TPS report. Oh, see, there it is. There it, yeah. it was a trick question. That's right. That's right. The TPS report is now available from Microsoft. So it's just uh, everybody wants to which, know that. Which, which cover sheet does it have it on it though, Mike? As, it I'm specify? telling you, I'm telling you somebody, some engineer at Microsoft is laughing right now about oh, yeah. this and just wondering how many people are going to catch it. You mean a former engineer at Microsoft? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to this didn't end well department. Um, Microsoft Authenticator code matching. I don't know if you remember, we talked about this. And what it was, was the ability to turn on code matching in the Authenticator app um, So for users and groups. So all they needed to do was match the number on the sign-in screen with the number in the app. I think I talked about this like a week or two weeks ago. Yeah. Yep. Well, now, bad idea. We're, our evaluating changes based on feedback, and we will not be moving forward with this. Uh, I have an assumption, and I kind of backed up this assumption, taking a look at the user voice uh, this morning, is that uh, there was a flood of security folks who just had a field day with this thing. So uh, Microsoft is going back to the drawing board on that. Um, and also the same thing is planners, new roster containers. I, I think I we talked about this and I remember Sherry right. was on the call yep. as well. Guess what? Yeah, not gonna do it. Um, they will not be giving out roster containers. Um, they evaluated feedback and we'll announce a new plan. So, you know, and for the third, third, could, could I just say that, that 
it, it, it's good that they're taking the feedback and they're responding right. to stuff. But right. then it makes me think it's like, should you share have shared a little bit more in advance and had some conversations with it prior to moving forward? Well, before you announced it publicly. I mean, that right. kind of just makes you look bad, right? It's kind of right. like the, the next one I'm going to talk about here is you remember we talked about the new service plan for Teams called Teams Pro? Yes. Remember that? Which Guess is, what? Yeah. Teams Pro is no more. <laughs> Um, they have decided to rename uh, Teams Pro to Teams for E3E5, Teams for A3A5, and Teams for BSBP. And I don't know what BS, Teams for BS, think about that. Um, to align with respective packages, commercial licenses. So Teams Pro, as the, you know, came out, um, just didn't stick well with people. And they decided to rename the whole the whole thing. So they're getting rid of that. that I know. That, and that was the, the, in that respect. I mean, they're adding new features. They even said as part of that initial communication, like there's, it's not a new plan. It's like they're adding some new features. Then why did you message it that way? Why did you even call it Teams Pro? I right. mean, it, it doesn't make sense. So people were all confused. They went up in arms, like, ah, I got to buy this license. What do I get? You know, with free, what do I get? You know, right. Yeah. Microsoft just, it, occasionally has issues with names. <clears throat> yeah. Changing them. Yeah, it just no causes reason. confusion. I guess I lost the bet on that one because I was voting for, I mean, my money basically was on Teams for Business. It follows the standard and the practices. Teams for, everything business, else for business, Pro and Pro Plus. Exactly. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> exactly. Plus one. So I've got one, uh, two more to do. And this one is around Teams again. Uh, Webinars Plus. Okay, so guess what? Webinars plus new meeting registration options. So now Teams is finally jumping on the webinar bandwagon. Remember live events? Well, now they're actually coming out with the, the uh, component or feature called webinars. <clears throat> uh, I, this is another confusing thing to me, uh, but they're excited to announce the forthcoming availability of the Teams webinar capabilities, uh, which will provide a registration page you know, with an email confirmation for registrants and reporting on registration and attendance. Yeah, well, now you're adding webinars to the mix. Why are you going to call it something different? Just keep it with Teams Live and say that you can have these capabilities. But no, they want to add this other name to it, which... Another skew, I, which I'm which I'm excited about because I think that was that was a gap. It I'm was, excited for the features, but I'm not excited yeah. about adding another name to it. It just doesn't right. make sense. Right. But I agree with you. <clears throat> it should have just been Teams Live and have those. And it's either a yeah. in, in, within the enterprise uh, versus a public webinar type capability. Right, right, right. Um, and finally, uh, something about uh, privacy. So new policy settings are available to control the feedback users can send to Microsoft. Um, now, this... What it does is they they kind of, well, what they did was they created this title and it, it really doesn't go with what the capability is. So what they're doing is when users are able to give feedback on the product, right? And what they're doing is they're collecting that feedback and they're allowing admins to be able to see that feedback. Now, from a privacy perspective, from a user standpoint, Maybe I say something in that feedback that may not be favorable to my organization adopting this product um, or something else. What what could this what could this possibly cause, you know, from a uh, privacy standpoint where a customer and a user is giving information back to uh, Microsoft, but then Microsoft decides, hey, we're going to share this with your admins as well. Well, is it anonymized or is it? No, it's not. Yeah, that that's no good. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm interested to see how this plays out because I have a feeling this is going to be another, oops, we're not going to do this uh, type of scenario, but we'll see. I mean, I, I, I'm, I can't see this flying. Ending, ending well? Is that? It, you yeah, know, outside just... of the U.S. <laughs> yeah. In the U.S., I mean, we're just... No, it's like what I've already shared that feedback on on TikTok, and uh, you know, so who cares? Yeah. 
uh, I did my in my follow up vi video that I created about my feedback. I get crowd reactions already. So yeah, yeah, anyway. yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, but that's that's it for the message center. Okay, <laughs> nothing else is happening in the message center, folks. Absolutely zero. Nothing. Mike has nothing covered you need everything. to look at. Nothing at all. The rest of it is garbage. It's a waste that's of time. Right. Microsoft should stop developing it because only these items are important, according to Mike Nelson. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, that, that's great. Yeah. E email me the list. I'll, I'll attach it in. And for those that are following us, do a couple things. I'm going to remember right up front, everybody, the disclaimer is coming up in a second. But uh, uh, if you uh, following along, so I'll have outlined each of the items that Mike uh, uh, you know, outlined as part of the message center updates, as well as every topic that we cover in today's uh, session, all the questions that we answer or attempt to answer or acknowledge that we don't know and just punt. Uh, address, nor. address, address <laughs> and passive form is that Correct. What you mean? passive yeah. passive aggressive you might as well yes. put that in there well yes yeah. yeah. so uh, yes that goes uh, that so with all of that will be outlined at, in a blog post at buckleyplanet.com as well as uh, publish all the videos out to youtube where you can find again that link list of everything that we cover um so with that anything else eric or hal anything that you have to add i think for future jump? future sessions we really need to rename that that segment mike's corner it need it, no. it deserves its own with a brand theme song. No. with a no. bobblehead no. with like a cartoon no. animation like a character that no. we can have is <laughs> you know like little little character mike walks in and there's like a little microsoft 365 logo there and he just smashes it with his foot and then gets into the <laughs> and then gets into the the details uh yeah there a bunch of well, a bunch I'm of uh, yeah a bunch of fun sound effects as well, like a like a, a Homer Simpson, the dope. You know, if there's uncertain news. No, I want the I wanted the news intro, like "Good Morning Vietnam" when Robert Williams says "d d d d d d d d d d d d d." You know, the the whole. Teletype and then what does he thing. say? What does he say again, Mike? It's I, I can't remember it exactly. What what is it? <laughs> no, I'm not going. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could get. Good you. morning. No, no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, not not that one. The next one. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> All righty then. Okay, let's jump in. Why don't we just uh, spearhead this uh, bad boy with uh, community question number one. Allard asked, that this question has probably been asked before, but I can't find it. I've done several SharePoint courses, and it's time to get things rolling. But at my company, they have shut down the most beautiful SharePoint additions, Power Apps, Power Automate, Flow, etc., and it's mainly used as an intranet. I want to dive deeper, but the question is how? Would Microsoft SharePoint Plan 1 give me all the possibilities to train my skills? The more, I, that's the first time I've ever heard SharePoint features called beautiful. That's the first time I've heard that. That was in the marketing. No, that was in the marketing. Oh, for, I'm sure. Go back to Jeff Teeper yeah. talking about how beautiful SharePoint would be. Yeah, but... Um, but that's I, you know that it it's always frustrating with an organization that you know right or wrong and in my estimation mostly wrong locks down everything in an organization and goes with the bare bones of what they're paying for, and so people within the organization they want to learn they want to go and develop their skills and add more business value to their company. Yes, but but there's always a but we don't know and there was no explanation in in the question there never who, is who or or where where this individual works yeah. right so you, you always have to take it from the strategic perspective of is there value in providing users with all those features if they work in an organization that truly does not need them and so uh, maybe the person we'll that in the he's corner a cashier. And he's a cashier at taco bell and wants to learn more exactly <laughs> I, w I would infer, though, that, that, and I don't know much about the SharePoint plans, but I'm assuming that SharePoint plan one will give you the basics, but it's not going to give you anything advanced. I mean, that is the basic plan, right? SharePoint plan one. I don't even know what the plans are anymore for the standalone, honestly, um, around yeah. it. But, but my first thought is, look, you have the demo environments, the free environments that are out there. 
Um, so any user can go and learn by using the, the, the demo environments. And so to go and sign up for the, the free demo and use that, and that's full functional, it has all of the licensing, it has dummy data within it, and you can do everything and learn. So if any, any training, whether you're following along on a YouTube video or you're doing a, a paid course where you, know, like you can leverage those demo systems and have everything that you need. And I think that's just demo.microsoft.com, uh, isn't it? Or demo.office.com? I'm not sure which one. I think if you do demo.microsoft.com, you'll find it. Just yeah. you can just put in Microsoft demo in the search and you'll be able to find it as well. Yeah. But and then, if you have a if yeah. you have a if you have a Visual Studio plan, a Visual Studio subscription plan, like the old MSDNs, that comes with it. So you can get a, you know, so if you have that capability, I don't know. I I don't know if they do or not, but yeah, just be aware that those demo environments, they do have a lifespan on that. And you will, uh, you know, you can always go in and you can request as you're a couple days away from that, you can go into Microsoft support and request an extension on that. I'm not sure how long they, they do extend if requested. That was every 30 days. Okay. So I thought it was like a required or new request every 30 days. Yeah. So, but if that's not essential, if you just want a, the demo environment and uh, and it's fine if it's refreshed at the end of 30 days, you just go spin up another demo. So uh, yeah, you just won't retain into that data. You can't obviously go and build a production environment on the demo environment. It doesn't work that way, mm -hmm. um, but for learning, it's fantastic. It's a great resource. All right, question number two. Uh, Brad says, I'm new to setting up Microsoft 365, and I recently discovered the mobile app on my Android device. I'm able to sign in, but why is there this warning when I open the app about updating Microsoft Intune and Authenticator? I have not set these up in Azure. I believe that it's, I mean, he's setting up 365, and by default, um, it the uh, mobile device management MDM is enabled for anyone who connects via Android or um, uh, Apple. iPhone. Yep. iPhone. iPhone. Yep. iOS. Okay. If you connect to a tenant that is an M365 tenant, you connect to it, there are default policies in place. And those one of those global default policies is for you to uh, be able to take prompts for a registration of the device. It doesn't require you to, but it prompts for a registration of the device to your organization. So I don't think it's a, it's a warning. I, 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 I mean, I understand he's getting that warning, but he shouldn't get it every time. I mean, you should be able to just tell it no, and then it won't do that. The only thing I can suggest is that he go into M365 and find out if MDM is actually enabled and what policies are set. Um, because it shouldn't keep prompting you. If if you say no, it should not. I, I, I haven't I haven't had that happen. Yeah, similarly, I I had it when it was newly set up exactly. And authentic, yeah, authenticator is only uh, presenting itself because of the password policy that's set. So password policy allows you different options. One is, <clears throat> what is it? Uh, um, question and answer. Question and response. Um, so it asks you three to five questions or whatever. Um, the other one is an authenticator app. The other one is SMS. Um, you know, there's like five, four or five of them. And depending on which ones are checked, um, it's going to prompt you to install that authenticator app because that's one of the four or five that are allowed for password authentication. Yep. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. See, I'm good for something. Yeah, something yeah, today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, question number three, Christine says, when I'm trying to send Teams link from Outlook, I keep getting a message at the top of the address bar that says, invitations for this meeting have not been sent, and the email is just not sending. Any ideas what may be causing this issue? I'm sending a Teams link. So Teams meeting? The Teams link. So I'm assuming it's either a link to a team to join a team, or is it a team's meeting? I don't know. Lots of questions on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, it is. It, it's not making sense to me. 
Um, it's not been sent. The email is just not sending. Is it stuck in her outbox? Is it, uh, you know, is it not even getting to her outbox? Yeah, I mean, I don't, we need more information on this one. Yeah, that's, I, you know, I think even having a screenshot of what she's yeah. doing or, or seeing, you know, it might just be, you know, the wrong information in the wrong place in the screen. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh, this, I'm, I'm just taking it back to what she said. I mean, Teams link from Outlook. So is that a team email address that it's just not recognizing for some reason? Is it internal? Is it external? It might be the share to Teams button. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, yeah, that you see, folks, that, that's why we're, it could be a number of different things the way that she's describing it. So I have having a screenshot or being very specific with what, yeah. what it is, you know. So I, I want to yeah. make it. Yeah, we need more information on this. Um, but before we move on to question number four, I have to ask Christian about his his new decorations in his office. Because are they, I mean, are they new? Mike, are they new or are they well, just replenished? They're replenished and they're they're kind of, you know, put out there as a I mean, everything is clean now for some reason. I don't understand. It's like it's like it's 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 actually somebody went in there and maybe took a, a couple of trash bags and kind of just, you know. <laughs> Christian, please on. explain your cleanliness. I say it was clean before. Thank you, Mike, but cluttered for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and after after months of my uh, wife complaining about it, who is a designer, and I said, fine, you do it. Like, do it your way. Whatever I do is not going to be good enough. You do it. And she fell and, for that? And she did it. Wow. So I just like to I, I like to point out that so she so she went through and decorated. So, you know, everything gone off the top across the board yeah. except for the Buckley Planet. And other stuff that got shoved in in cabinets and things i'll point out that i took baby yoda and i put him elsewhere in my down here in the basement over by my music gear over by the window and she put it back so hey. i think she gave me that that one piece that is, is me <laughs> the, the rest of it i mean i had to you, you probably can't see it but i've got like the george washington kneeling and praying yeah. but with his horse yeah. that was just on a different wall she moved that over there and uh, and then she pulled my I've got some collector's editions books and things and she pulled the dust covers off them because she thought it looked better. It's you know. a designer. It's I a, know. You know, know, it's a visual thing. And this but, is really this is really cramping my OCD here, dude. Yeah. Is behind you, you have four rows of MVP plaques, and the last row only has one. And it is totally out of proportion, and it's driving me crazy. Well, you know, <laughs> it'll be a little bit more balanced here in a couple more months with the next one. So, wow. yeah. you know, it's just a matter of. I I know I so Mike in my OCD as well. I thought about that, like how can I configure this? Unfortunately, you know, I didn't want to go two rows of five all the way down with the other still showing up and I just have to reconfigure again anyway. So, well, yeah. in, in the meantime, uh, Mike's going to send you one of his so, <laughs> two, yeah. two of ah. yours, just as placeholders, Mike, I'll ship them right back. That's, that's cool. <laughs> I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to get one next year, uh, you know, so, you know, I'll just take the one that I get this year and I'll send it to you. Oh uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So it's, uh, no, I'm, I, you know, honestly, they were, all stacked just on a shelf, not on display. And that was another thing that I'm the one that put them up there measured and got them all aligned, but it was my wife telling me that to put them up there. So why does everything look blue? Because of the blue light. You have a blue light. Ah, yes. I see. Yeah. There's a like a light special. There's like a string light that's going up around there as well. I'm, I'm actually, my wife wants me to drill holes in this and put like, shelf lighting in as well so maybe that'll happen someday maybe christian is actually in aisle four at the local kmart that's what he's right. trying to say that's right exactly. it's, it's a backdrop yep 
using the lighting. <laughs> That's right. All right. So, all right. Let's, let's, let's jump get back, back to interesting yeah. stuff here. Okay. Question number four from Luke says, I've created a workbook to log information from my work. So workbook equals Excel, correct? Yes. Uh, in this, I had a notes section that I could log all conversations I had when I had contacted a customer. So when I hover over the purple indicator in the cell, it would show me the conversation or keynotes I've had with customers. I've just opened my workbook today to try and view or add to these comments, and all comments now have a red indicator in the cell, and the text says the following, threaded comment, your version of Excel allows you to read this. How can I recover my notes as they are extremely important to my work? The, yeah, the rest of that comment goes, it allows you to read this, but any edits you make will not be saved. Uh, and the reason that I get that the, the, <clears throat> I've been looking around for, it seems to be, it depends on the version of Excel that you are running. Uh, threaded notes, and I put a link in the uh, in the chat for that. Threaded notes is a threaded comments is a new feature. Uh, and if you uh, happen to use Excel from either the MSI version of the package, mm -hmm. the uh, box retail thing, or if you've got an earlier version of Excel, or if you have one that just hasn't quite gotten updated enough, you get that message. You can look at the contents of the cell, but the edits that you make won't won't stick. And like I say, I, I put this uh, this link to a page in the chat that goes into that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So I have a uh, yeah. So I've got that the link, and I'll include it in the blog post as well. I guess I can post it out in the Facebook live stream as well. There we go. Excellent. Yeah, that's that's frustrating though, uh, it, it, especially if there's a change that happens. If you've been using it one way and suddenly there's something like that impacted, and, you know, I, I, impacting, and it's it's not a major feature that you would notice. And certainly, it wasn't in Mike's you know message center updates. But so it's easy to miss a change like that that could impact your productivity, yeah. how you're working. So yeah. that's the well, kind of he, feedback. He if, with... if something changes like that with a new feature and suddenly it stops working the way that it used to work, you need to provide that feedback back to Microsoft as well to make sure it wasn't a mistake. Yeah, well, that's the, the first comment said in, in the first paragraph that it deals with the fact that this is new. You may have it, you may not. If you do have it, here's what it is. If you've got older versions or if you've got the MSI version, guess what? Not there. So yeah. Awesome. No, it's always nice when somebody's done the work in the blog post and we're able to find it and share that other rich content out there. So uh, makes it easier for us to jump to more SharePoint questions that Mike can answer for us. <laughs> so question number five, Jose says, uh, how to automatically add members to channels. So talking about teams, how can you automatically add members to channels from an Excel list instead of adding them one by one? Is this possible? Yes, it is. And I've added the links uh, to the chat. Um, one is a YouTube video that somebody created uh, around how to do it. But then there's also an official Microsoft response that of course they want you to use. So don't uh, do it? <laughs> well, no, what they want you to do is they want you to use uh, M365 groups. And then we create an M365 group and then you add uh, that group to the team. So there's the official Microsoft response is here, this is how you create this, you know, import uh, a CSV file to create a distribution group in M365 and then just go to the team and then add that. So instead of importing them directly into Teams, they're saying it's better to create a group because you can use you can utilize the whole group feature then, you know, inside of 365, which makes sense. Right. Well, cool. All right. Well, I've shared both of those links. Thank you for those uh, over in the uh, live stream feed as well. And we'll jump to question number six. Uh, Megna says, can someone tell me what are display pages in SharePoint Online? Display pages. Any no, relevant Microsoft no. article would also help. This was a question asked in an interview. 
How can you customize search using display pages? So just thought of checking here with experts across the globe. That was that was an interview question. Yes. Why sounds they... like sounds like a trick. Well, kind yeah. of like kind of like, and I'm going by assumption here. Megna's name is actually Megan. I'm just spelling it how I'm this just, person wrote it. It's but I just agree with you. <laughs> a shot in the dark. So Megna, if this question sounds like yours, and Megan, it sounds like yours too. It's likely the same question from the same person. <laughs> So is this, is this, let me think about this. So yeah. customizing a search using display pages. So are they talking about customizing the search results? That's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking as well. Because I've never heard of any, and I'm not a SharePoint person as everyone knows, but I have never what? heard the terminology. But you play one on TV once again. I know, oh. I know, I know. <laughs> um, but I've never, doctor, 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 doctor. Um, I've never her, I mean, display pages. What I don't, that doesn't ring anything with me. Well, that's why I was, I, I kind of jumped to the same thing. It's like, I think it was a test because they're not a thing. Yeah. You're testing for, for you to push back and say, oh, those are not a thing. If you're, yeah. I mean, because honestly, if there's anything that's real in the SharePoint world, there's a hundred blog posts on it and videos everywhere. Oh, yeah. A day. So if not you so can't find it out there, right. If, if you can't find it, it doesn't exist. Even brand spanking new capabilities, there's Microsoft content on it. There's something out there. You'll find discussions out on tech community and elsewhere. Yeah, I would think they're they're looking at a custom search result page because you can create those. Um, and that's easy to do. I mean, there's actually a page here on docs.microsoft.com and how to customize you know, a search results, but right. There's tons need, of it. Right. Display page, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's tons of info on that, on search results, displays, reporting, uh, different angles, depending on what it is that you're looking for, but nothing that's called display pages. So words matter, people. Sounds more like slang than anything else. You know, if you refer to it internally as a display page, a page which surfaces results for you, then that's what it is. I say yeah. that it's just the kind of question that Megna, a person named Megna, would ask. <laughs> Megan would ask for search page results, search page displays. You know, there's nothing wrong with being dyslexic, Christian. I'm just throwing it out there. Okay. Thank you. We poke fun, but we do it out of love. So we only really poke fun at each other, though. If you play the tapes yeah. back, you see yeah. that it's all yeah, very mostly. familial, if you will. Mostly. I think when there's angry responses, I think everybody here would agree with me. They mostly come from Sean. That's true. <laughs> sure. He's not here to defend himself. That's uh -huh. right. That's right. We, but we would say the exact same thing if he was here. That's true. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And, he, and he would go like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Question number seven from Onyx. Uh, does anyone have a good place to start learning more about Azure for beginners? I wish to learn if it's worth utilizing Access and Excel with Azure, uh, or if there's a way to do everything I need through Azure alone. So I had a, I, I, it was going great for the first part of, of that question and, until he got to the second sentence. The, the second <laughs> part. Yeah. Because uh, Access and Excel really don't have anything to do with Azure <laughs> unless it's an authentication thing. You know, there's, uh, are you talking about M365, I'm assuming? Um, you have to understand there's a difference between Azure, okay, which is the public cloud provider and authentication backend for Microsoft 365, which is the application side, right? It's, uh, it's the online office apps it's the you know all the things that we talk about in this this uh podcast yeah. um but there's there's not a lot of correlation between the two unless it's authentication can i also just point out that if you're a beginner and you want to learn more about office 365 <laughs> don't start with access <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> but so let, let's say that just the first question there, like, like Mike, where do you advise people like that want to go and learn and, and just get started? Kind of where do you point them? So I actually point them to two different places. The first place is uh, the Microsoft Docs and Hands-On Labs. So Microsoft has its own labs, right? And it has its own docs. Um, they're very, I mean, the docs have gotten so much better than what we were used to uh, years ago. Now they're written by real people, you know, and not, they don't not go those through fake people that yeah, work for Microsoft. Yeah. yeah. They don't go through robots and in the, the, the folks that want to inject marketing and all that other kind of fun stuff. Um, but it, it really is. I, I mean, I've had people that have had no, nothing about Azure and they'll start looking through that and they'll look through the, the, uh, labs <clears throat> and then they'll actually get the free subscription to Azure and they'll just start, you know, taking some of the, when you get the free subscription, it has a bunch of tutorials to step through. Um, they come back and they say they learned a lot from it because they're actually doing it. You know, they're not just reading about it. They're actually doing it. And that's a big step. I mean, I could tell them to go to Pluralsight or a, you know, a cloud guru or uh, Udemy or any of these other sites that provide training. But most of the time, not all of the time, you're not actually doing it. You're not actually clicking. You're not actually moving through things and, and creating things. And that's what you need to do um, in order to fully understand it. So, you know, Microsoft has gotten really good. We've talked about previously, like for Teams and for SharePoint and kind of any other new features or capabilities come, up, come out over on the modern workplace side of these adoption sites. Yeah. And... And so Microsoft, it has gotten so much better at producing that kind of content very quickly up front as part of that, you know, general availability. Mm -hmm. And then kind of what we were talking about earlier is like go to demo, like you have the demo site, mm -hmm. you have the ability to pay zero to go in and get full featured access in a limited basis, limited time, but these demo tenants, tem demo environments. So you can try everything and kick the tires. Right. And I mean, I've had people come back to me and say, well, <clears throat> I don't want to pay for this. After after they started to learn it, they're like, oh, my free subscription, you know, it came to the end of my free subscription. And now they want me to go switch to pay as you go or whatever. That's not true anymore. Right. Free sub lasts forever now. Anyways, <clears throat> they, they come back and they're like, well, you know, I don't want to pay for this. And I'm like, well, you're starting to learn it, right? And if it's something that you really utilize, if it's something that is going to benefit you, is going to benefit your profession, it's going to benefit your work, then I don't see any reason why you don't pay for it. I mean, a M365 um, home and family subscription is 99 bucks a year. And that gives you up to, what, five or six people, I think it is, um, that you can add to that subscription. Why? I mean, you're going to use it, right? I mean... And then there are other plans that are out there as well. But I mean, from an Azure perspective, pay as you go. You're only going to pay for what you use. So I always I always seem to have that <clears throat> that discussion after they started learning. They're like, oh, I, I love this free stuff. I want to keep getting this free stuff. Well, they can't keep giving you free stuff. <laughs> I mean, that's not how that's not how companies make money. So, yeah. Well, it's uh, well, I. I, you know, I'll end it on that. That's a, that's a great, great point. Let's move on. Yeah. All right. Uh, question eight from Bick. All day, every day, I use the preview. I think Bick stops to eat, to shower, to occasionally sleep. So it's a slight exaggeration. Just read the oh, words, question. but I'll Just move read on. The words. All day, oh, every day, I God. use the preview option in Explore Bick, could you, what, files. What Christian's yeah. saying is. Bick, could you just confirm that you you do other things over the course of your day? I think that would really be please. There goes my internet. Anyway. Oh. <laughs> oh. All right. So all day, every day, I use the preview option in Explorer Files. In the past, I was able to move from document to document. PDF, Word, and Excel all would preview with no dramas. Now I am getting a preview of one or two before I need to close down and restart Explorer for the preview to work. I've spent time and, and money with my IT guy only to be told this is a new feature Microsoft introduced. 
allowing only a certain amount to be previewed. This is truly slowing my productivity. How can I stop this happening? Or when will Microsoft fix the issue? I don't know if anyone else is having this issue. So the preview looking at a file, my the way I interpreted that was, you know, the, being able to scan through the entire document, the entire artifact in the preview without actually clicking and opening. And Microsoft has said, mm -hmm. now we're just going to give you the first couple pages because the purpose of the preview is not to be able to look through the entire doc in a little, you know, small format, but to give you the first couple pages so you can identify, yes, this is the content. This is the document that I'm looking for and then open that's, it. That's the term preview. Preview. Yes. And not only that, it's a caching thing, yeah. right? Because they have to cache all that information and that takes up room in, on your in RAM, which has to be flushed every time you look at a new document. Um, and then they start storing it temporary, temporarily to disk and you run into all kinds of fun things happening there. And you, when you're flushing that kind of sizable RAM, it's going to clog your pipes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep, it will. Uh, Eric, are you surprised I went there? No. No, I'm not surprised. in the slightest. I'm surprised this guy, this person spent money with an IT. I, I would question yeah, it's it, like, you know, <laughs> that you, your time uh, on that. But I, but again, this is something where, like I just said pre you know, earlier, that if this is a change has impacted your way of doing business, you need to provide through proper channels back to Microsoft. Um, contact support, go to user voice and add an item that you want the feature back. Um, find it or open up uh, it, probably the, 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 the least time consuming or effort around that is to go and search and find if anybody else out in the Microsoft tech community site is talking about this. If not post it there and so that you can have members of the product team in the relevant area category, um, you know, uh, to, to go do a search. If you don't find it, post a comment on there um, and you know, get other people from your organization that are also feeling the impact of that to go in and like it, to thumbs up, to comment on it. And Microsoft, the product teams will respond. So I say working as, a, as designed for all the reasons, Mike, you brought up, that's the way it should work. Yeah, and I would just I would just point to Eric or Hal, who are the experts on this topic, to chime in if they feel necessary. So that was a point without a real point. It wasn't like a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I I agree with with everything that everyone's saying here. The the what it comes down to is that is is the best practice that this individual is using. Um, going to drive some sort of change one way or the other. I, I'm i not sure that I would recommend using preview as you know your Windows Explorer window. Uh, that may not be the best practice if you want to find or locate content. You could take it one step further and look at the content and say, you know, it, it should be fairly straightforward as to what content is out there, what you're looking at. You should need to preview every file to figure out which one you are looking for. So we could go down that path for 20 minutes. But it, it's a uh, the only other I thing. Go ahead, Hal. Oh well, the, the only other thing would be if his preview just simply quits working altogether, and he's not looking to preview, look at the whole document, but just simply to see the first page. And after two or three of them, it isn't showing him the first page anymore. Uh, I am not able to duplicate that. Uh, in my case, I get previews for pretty much everything, though. It depending on what it is I'm previewing, it may take a little while for the preview to pop up. So if it's killing, uh, if but it's, it's if dying. He is, if he's not getting his previews at all after two or three, then indeed he needs to go and talk to somebody about it. Uh, user voice would be the a good place to look to see if anybody else is experiencing that. Uh, if not, then uh, as you suggest, get all the Microsoft support and let them know. Yeah, That's the key. Let, you got to let Microsoft know about this kind of stuff. It goes unreported. It may not be worked on. May, they might be unaware of a business reasoning for a change they've made. And so as we've talked about, as Mike pointed out this morning, is that Microsoft does go back. They recognize when they've overstepped on things or 
or had a few drinks and then named a product and need to uh, <laughs> move backwards on that. I wasn't going to go there. You point. went there. You went there. I didn't go there, but you went there. Uh, yeah. We were all thinking it. Come on. Come on, man. No, I was thinking that there was no preview in uh, Teams. That's what I was thinking. So if you if you look at, uh, what would you call it? Um, File Explorer? No, I was going to say next generation, you know, what they're building. Uh, yeah, file file preview exists in SharePoint. It doesn't really in Teams. So what's the what's the best practice? What's the recommendation? Um, I mean, it's when I've used it. Yes, it's familiar when you. Or is it not familiar? It's it's convenient when you go and and you're trying to find something and locate something that isn't familiar to you. But I'm I'm curious what what Big does on a daily basis because if this is an all day every day scenario then there's probably something else that could be added workflow or you know something that can be integrated to make his life a bit easier yep agreed i agree with hipster santa thank you <laughs> all right uh question number nine from murray uh sharepoint and windows 10 home I've just realized that my secondary computer, my laptop that I use for site is actually running Windows 10 home and not pro. What sort of issues will I encounter with running SharePoint or other Microsoft 365 apps? None. Don't think you'll have all that much trouble with the apps. What you'll have trouble with is anything that you need to do that requires an AAD log again, because Windows 10 home will not do Azure Active Directory or Active Directory at all. You can't join it to a domain. Yeah, so if you're accessing things via the cloud, I mean, like, it, it, so that shouldn't have any problems there, you know, accessing those applications remotely. But if you're using that as your primary work, I guess, is that the question? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't understand. I mean, nothing will change from, from a home to a pro perspective for the apps. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, question number 10 from Martin. So we have an old intranet in PHP where we have news posts that we want to import to news in SharePoint. Is this possible and how to go about doing this? Copy paste. <laughs> um, <clears throat> literally, because you don't know what the back end is, right? I mean, if you can export the the news posts from your old system in if it's in some kind of database format which i'm assuming a php front end with a mysql back end or a, a postgres or a miradb or whatever you'd be able to export those and then be able to bring them into sharepoint um, or simply just do like i said a copy paste uh, from one to the other so long long time ago um you know, I knew that you know, some of the third party vendors, the ISVs had solutions that would also go and help automate that process. But honestly, I'm not looked at it in a long time. No, there's too many variables on the on the old on the old side. Yeah. You know, there's just there's to cover all of them. If yeah. you have a tool that covers them all. You're no, essentially all that it would do is pull the content. I don't know if even how it handled images. But it would, you know, so you define the template to move that stuff into, and so it would go and it's just a slight modification of copy paste one by one manually. Screen scrape. So just yeah. scrape, scrape the screen and put it, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but there was a way to, so these, the, the tools, the migration tools were able to do some of that. So that, that could be an option. If you're talking about, depends on the volume of content. Because the other thing to think about with any migration, and, and it would be resolved with the screen scrape method as well as you're going through that old content not all of it you're going to want to move so you, if right. you can automate it and do it and and not have to think much about it and it strips out all of the you know links and images and but just post the content so that you have it from an historical perspective in the search capability it's like having an archive um then i i you know i don't know if the third party tools do more beyond that and but you know do do you care? Is half of that content really just slowing down the performance in your environment and is really not worth migrating over? 
a migration, whether manually or automated, it's an opportunity for you to go and clean up. And there's a lot of value in cleaning up from time to time. So performance wise, make sure that there's nothing, you know, I, IP that's out there where you're just, you know, convoluting good content, more up to date content with old content, which is outdated and should be deleted anyway. And so use that opportunity to go and scrub. So, I don't know, Eric, anything that you would add to that? Because you've done a few of those migrations. I have. Um, I mean, not really. I, yes, I could go on for a long time about it, but I think you hit all the main points there. That and I have to jump to a 12 o'clock meeting, so. Yeah, no worries. Gotta, excuse myself. Excused. Yeah, I see Hal going, what? 12 o'clock? It's, it's not yeah, even 10. Nine here. I, I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys. All right. See thanks you a lot. Take care. Bye. All right. Uh, question number 11. Um, now, and, and gentlemen, of course, now if anything goes wrong with the program from here on out, it's Eric's fault. It's his fault. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's yeah, right. and I got to go in a couple minutes too. So you guys are going to run this show by yourself. No, that's that's fine. Well, let's uh, we'll 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 take them and and uh, you know anything goes astray, you know it'll happen. Yeah. Um. So let's see. So number eleven, Zeke asks, uh, may I ask what business standards or other Office three sixty five tenants use in implementing DLP? Do you create for every template in Office 365? Actually, just using the Compliance Center in M365 will help you with this. <clears throat> I've set up the Information Protection uh, in Compliance Center and being able to, uh, you have the ability to implement it on a individual level, okay, a per user level or per device level, um, not just on a per template type of level. Um, you can do it set up a policy that only targets specific data protection. Um, but I highly recommend them going through the compliance center and determining which policies, you know, they would like to implement because it's very flexible in, in what can be done um, and how broad you want it to be. A whole organization uh, specific to a group, specific to, you know, uh, a, a user or device, you know, you have all those options. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Okay. Um, question number 12. You got time for one more, Mike? Or are you out? Uh, yep. Okay. Let's just jump in with Derek. I'm having a really weird issue with Teams for one of my users. We have done a complete reinstallation of Teams on her computer, but whenever she gets an invite to a Teams meeting, clicking on the link in the invite results in a message that Teams is out of date. It needs to be updated. The update link doesn't work. And when I check her version of Teams, it shows the latest version. Has anyone else ever had this issue? I've personally uninstalled and reinstalled Teams three times. I have never, never heard of this issue. I've not heard of this either. No, uh, about all I can think is how exactly did you completely install it and did that pull the cache and other such things that it creates? Uh, clearing the cache is the only other thing I could think of. Let's just point out that sometimes there are valid reasons for talking to support. That's There's right. Something, <laughs> something else that's going on here. It could be a problem at the tenant level. It could be a problem with her, her setup. Yep. It, you know, a configuration issues, something else. Um, I mean, I, I I don't think that this would be a permissions issue on any side because she's not really getting into the application to where there's something else going wrong. But right. Yeah, I would. I hate doing that, but saying yeah. contact support. Disclaimer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I and I never showed that the uh, the disclaimer. I guess I should yeah. uh, have it appear there of the. <laughs> You get what you pay for yeah. with the uh, with the advice we provide here. All right. It's so. been fun, guys. I got to jump. All right. See you next week. See ya. Ciao. And we are uh, at question number three. This is the uh, Christian and Hal show now as we go through. And uh, let's see. 
Um, question 13, Justin says, we're in the process of transitioning our business from G Suite to Microsoft 365. And after 10 years with Google, we will have shared mailboxes and 365 groups for the purpose of storing archiving email so it's visible to key team members. Would, would you recommend using A, public folders, B, folders within a shared mailbox, or C, move email to a 365 group? 365 groups don't yet have some of the functionality of public folders, although it seems to be the way Microsoft wants to go. Any thoughts? Not really. <laughs> the best I can say is uh, public folders are an old bugaboo that they've been trying to get rid of for years and years and years, and people won't do it uh, because they're, they're they're just way too useful. Uh, the shared mailbox is a is a is a reasonable option. Um, I haven't played around with groups enough to know from the standpoint of what he wants to do whether that'll get the job done for him or not. Well, yeah, so my my response is the same. I'm, I'm not that familiar with all of the capabilities, the gaps with G Suite and for the move. I mean, certainly I understand Microsoft's directive, you know, their recommendations is moving email to over to the groups and leveraging that because that is key to what how Microsoft maps their users and folders and 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 inboxes. So um, that makes sense. If there's a disparity with the features, um, then you just need to prioritize that. Yeah. I mean, there's tons of content. Again, my doing these kinds of migrations is not new. And so my company, AvPoint, has a tool with migrating people over. And with any ISV that has solutions, there's a ton of content out there that talks about some of these mappings, walks you through it, explains what you know, to, to look for, what to look out for, and probably has guidance on how to mitigate, you know, around these missing features. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't have any other detail because I've yeah. just, I've, not, I've been out of the migration space for too long. But yeah, I mean, we were working on this back in 2014, 2015. And um, I, I, I have to imagine that the tech, uh, the, the ISV solutions for these have only improved since then. You would certainly think. Yeah, could be wrong. I don't know. But uh, yeah, I uh, wish, wish I had more to, to add on that, but that's where we are. Mm. Yeah. All right, uh, question 14 from Christoph. Uh, dear all, oh, that's nice. Uh, unfortunately, this is German, uh, so it's been translated. All right. Since last week, we fortunately got the share to teams feature within Outlook. Worked out quite well since today. Now this screen shows up after trying to share an Outlook email to teams saying you need to change to teams to approve this function. After clicking it, switches to teams with the account pull down upper right opened, but no matter what I do, I don't get this sharing function to work. Any help is greatly appreciated as I've been waiting for this for a long time. So uh, I do understand, I've not gone and looked at it um, and played with it uh, extensively uh, that there were some issues. I don't know if this is something that's been resolved. My, this was a known issue that Microsoft was working on um, so maybe by the time here we are talking about it, and it's been a couple days since this was posted, that it may have even been resolved. Um, but this is something that, I mean, I, I would, how I would go and try and resolve this without calling support is, you know, again, do a search. There's been a lot of discussion, other people reporting this issue, and go into those threads and see if they've resolved it or if it's something that's a known Microsoft issue that is being worked on and follow those threads, follow those discussions. If you don't find all these things, again, this is something that it, you need to let Microsoft know so that if they have not resolved it, that they know that it's, uh, you know, more companies are being impacted by this. And, 
you know, the, the more numbers that we have of people that are experiencing an issue um, helps increase the priority for any of these issues. Absolutely. So I really haven't uh, played around with that one all that much either. It, uh, but it, it sounds like it's a feature that they're trying to get functioning correctly or having a few hiccups, as per most things on Teams, it would seem. At least that's certainly been my experience with new features. They uh, they show up, they work, they show up, then they don't work, uh, then they go away, and then they come back. And maybe well, they the, other, the other issue, too, is that you have so many configuration options, I mean, more so in, in, in Outlook than over in Teams, where Microsoft has been trying to standardize these SaaS platforms um, but there's still so many different options out there. There's, there's something that's been a you know, configuration or something else within your environment, your company's environment, that is causing the issue here. Again, that's another reason why to provide feedback back to Microsoft so they can look specifically at your tenant, um, your user profiles, and, and see if it's something that is unique or is a re repeat of what they're seeing elsewhere for them to be able to provide guidance. I guess the, the, the telemetry helps Microsoft to solve these issues, but yeah. yeah. <clears throat> It'll be interesting to see what direction they want to go from user voice and as much as that. This is, hey, this is a big feature. I, I've been wanting this feature for a long time. Like, like a lot of people, like I've been doing the kind of the manual process of going into a channel um, and grabbing, copying the email for that channel, going back, forwarding emails from Outlook over. So having the button is just easy. You could still do mm -hmm. that manual process if it's not, the button is not working for you. So there's a workaround for that. Um, but um, yeah, provide the feedback back to Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I, yep. All right. Um, 15, Vivek says, hello team. Has anyone configured MS Teams group membership dynamically using another AD security group or mail enabled security group? Microsoft 365 group membership provides dynamic membership queries, but does not provide any rule or query to map any security group. Any other way if someone has achieved it or from Power App? I have no clue. This is beyond my scope of stuff yeah. that I've played with. It's yeah, my, me neither. So I think we we you know what we may on some of these that we're just not the right personnel for this. We might hold until next week, Hal. Yeah, I think that's probably a good plan. So I'll highlight this one. So let's. Um, how are you on IIS? Uh, not that great. All right. I'll hold that because some of these I had specifically added for Mike and Sean to help mm -hmm. with here. Um, <laughs> so here, here we go. So uh, 17, uh, Gail asks, we all have E5 licenses. However, some staff who are organizers of meetings and record can only download the recording. It does not go to their stream. I am one of the lucky ones that can see the recording and stream. And I am in IMT. Whatever that is. Is there a setting somewhere that determines if staff can view the recordings and stream? Well, you know that, it, so the recordings are now, um, so they're downloaded to SharePoint. And so and it, you, know, you record that, depending on the permission of the, the meeting, it should be right there in the meeting's notes, mm -hmm. you know, in the, in the conversation for that meeting. And everybody should be able to see that. So I guess my my question would be, you know, is there, you know, within your your tenant in your environment, is somebody moving them back? You're still saying you're still automatically seeing them over in stream. It, are you sometimes seeing it within SharePoint, the new experience? Are people able to see the recording there in the in the conversation, but when they click on it, they're not able to view it? Like I guess I have too many questions on what the actual experience, what the issue is here. Yeah. Yeah, because the the way that it works now is that, you know, uh, so I believe it's by default. I don't know if there's anything that you manually have to do to switch that over. The classic 
you know, uh, way that team would do it, it previously was automatically capture that within stream. So if you wanted to download or view it, you'd go over in the stream capability. Now by default, it's within SharePoint and there are benefits to that for the managing of those, those assets. Um, and you have to then move that over into stream as part of that, that experience. But uh, I don't know if that's something that you have to do uh, manually or if some users have you know, selected that option to remain using in stream or not, um, but that might be part of the discrepancy. I don't know. I, you know what? Let me let me take this as uh, as homework. And uh, I'll 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 take a look at that and bring that back up. So I want to want to see what that is. I want to understand for myself, like. You know, what what process needs to happen if anything is it automatic or is there a manual step are people able to uh you know remove themselves from that normal like shift over to sharepoint and remain on stream and what that user experience looks like so what happens if you know the two of us are both using teams you do a recording it's available in the thread i push it i my default is to stream what that experience looks like so yeah happy to take okay. that on I don't know if you see a pattern here, Hal. I only take the homework items where I, <laughs> I want to know the answer to. Yeah. So, all right, uh, number 18. Uh -oh. um, another question from Zeke. It says, I was, uh, I was tasked with gathering Office 365 email filtering settings to be provided to an auditor. What's the best way to gather this? A screenshot of the spam filter, a malware, malware filter? What else? Sorry, I was uh, I was absent for a second there. Oh, so Zeke says I was tasked with gathering Office 365 email filtering settings to be provided to an auditor. What's the best way to gather this? Is it a screenshot of spam filters or malware malware filters, or what else? What other ways are there to to gather those filter settings for email? It seems to me that might well be well available in the uh, Exchange Admin Center. Uh, at least that would be the place that I would go to try to start to searching for that sort of a thing, because uh, that way you can uh, you can check various email settings for more than one person at a time. Uh, exactly how to go about that, I couldn't begin to tell you because I haven't. Uh, <laughs> that's that's something that. I haven't played with in a few years, and so the admin center is a whole bunch different now than it used to be. But at, at least from the standpoint of what was available, that was something that you could, that would be where I would go to start this. I know that there are some third-party tools as well that allow for the, yeah. the scanning of that. Um, you have any interest in taking a homework item on that one and looking and providing some links? Uh, sure. Okay. Yeah, because I, I think there's a few different options that are out there, but I agree with you. I'm not familiar with what's been updated in the admin center. It may all may all be there. All right. I'll I'll send you a reminder on that that okay. task. All right, uh, we've got four more questions here. We've got about 15 minutes, so we might be able to get through these. Whether we can answer any of them, that's the question, but that's Indeed. all right. Um, Geert asks, I would like to start using shifts for my team. We need to, that's one of those things that I've been meaning to go and set up. I've been using yeah. uh, Calendly for years, and mm -hmm. I've been wanting to make the shift to shifts for teams. Uh, we need to keep a factory running 24 hours, seven by seven, I have three maintenance guys staffed, one morning, one evening, and one night shift. Is there any way to make it visible or to get a notification on days that one of these three shifts isn't staffed? So when in one of these three guys has a holiday, it should be visible. Now I'm using Excel and conditional format to make this visible in a color. Okay, well, I myself have not played around with shifts enough to know whether or not that's that's feasible. So that kind of sounds like 
a little more explanation exploration is necessary. Well, yeah. So I'm not familiar either to know if the, if shifts is it connected to the personal calendar of those individuals? Because if there was that integration, if they were linked up, then you would think that it yeah. changed my calendar, my availability. Otherwise, if it's more of an island, like I would need to go in. If I own one of those shifts and I'm going to be out, whether sick or vacation, that I would need to go in there and make that modification within the shared calendar so that it was visible elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, otherwise it's, you know, as the shift manager or as the manager of that calendar, that process, there'd be a manual process and you now manual update. I think most people in yeah. the world would probably do it the same way using Excel and keeping track of those kinds of changes. Yep. Yeah. And like I said, I, I don't know what the tie in, whether there would be something to tie that in with the Excel arrangement to get it started in shifts or not, but I haven't played around with shifts enough to know. In fact, I haven't played with it at all yet. They're just, I mean, the organization that I work for, there's like six people. And uh, so. Well, something like this too, it's like, um, you know, is, it, 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 you know, managing something exception, how often is this exception, you know, a pain? I mean, how often are you really on a monthly basis you're having to go in every couple of months? Or is it like every week there's something new where you want to automate it so that you're not spending as much time with? Like, you know, how much Very of a hassle point. is that really? You're talking about three people and managing their calendars. Yeah. On the surface, that doesn't sound that complex. Yeah. I mean, because the other side for that, again, it's disconnected from shifts. And I think it'd be great if it's integrated and works. But if you have a the ability just to scan every once in a while, those if you're you have shared calendars and you can see if they go in and mark in their calendars that they're out, and you'd be able to see that very quickly with the, just having shared calendar looking, opening all three of their shared calendars and looking to see if you see any discrepancies um, and then making the change over in shifts, but mm -hmm. yeah. All right, uh, question 20. Mickey says, this might, oh, you know, this is unrelated to the tech. This is an interesting question. Uh, this might not be related to the group, but there's a good, any good way to say so this was placed in a, Microsoft 365 group community out there on Facebook, but is there any good way to identify yourself other than a badge in a company? So 150 employees more or less or outside the company, or we always carry our mobile phones these days and there is a more modern way to identify yourself to others. So, well, know. thank you to, thanks to the pandemic, we soon will all have a chip in our hands showing that we were vaccinated. So I wonder if you could <laughs> use the implant uh, as yeah. this ID. Yeah. yeah, the problem is, the problem with the digital device is that you can spoof it. You can hack it, swap out whatever information that you're scanning on that with the phone, with the picture or something that's on it. Um, you know, it's 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 harder to go and do that to um, it's like counterfeit money. It's like anybody can go in Xerox, but no one's going to believe the Xerox copy. But if you see with all the protections that are in place, similarly with the badge, there are you know other than what's visible, there are other methods of of checking the validity of, uh, you know, a fake ID um, to get scanned into a building. There are security devices that are enabled as part of that. Um, so it's. It, it, you know, I, yeah, I would be you know, wary. RFID for that, one thing. Right. And that that's probably not something that your phone's ever going to do. Right. So, so. I, yeah, I mean, I like, I like the idea, <laughs> the idea of that. 
but it's, uh, I mean, for things like, uh, like I now have uh, for the two theaters that are in opposite directions, but are that very close to my home, I have the, the apps for these small theater systems for both of those. And how convenient it is, it's worth the additional buck or buck 50 to use their app to buy a ticket, but then not have to print anything and have it right there. And all of my rewards that I get for discounts on food and other things that just come with that. And all I do is I go and I pull up and it has a barcode and stick it under the scanner and write in. I mean, it's it's fantastic. I love that. But, you know, there's no fear of personal uh, information or any other security issues with going to a movie versus going in and out of a company that could be in a regulated and highly secure environment. Yeah, absolutely. So you need those extra digital protections and things, or at least whatever they just even deem necessary is what you got to do. Right. Mm-hmm. Anyway, but it's an interesting question. I, you know, and, and Maybe something new will happen in this space in future years. I, I don't know. You know, you can always you think like we have you know, multi-factor authentication and maybe they do something right then and there where you have the ID on your phone and then the system sends a secure encrypted link to what should be that person and they have to enter a, a code or something. So there might be some MFA type thing like like there but it's not going to be a simple scan in so yeah well they might build an eyeball retinal scan or into your phone someday that's what i want that's what i want use my phone and put my eye up to the scanner get right in very tom cruise Mission impossible-esque yes absolutely i'm all for that uh, let's see. Question 21. John says, uh, anyone run across this Word 365 issue? Okay. How? We've got a Microsoft Word question here. Starting okay. with macros being lost every time computer shuts down, then progress to macros lost every time the file closed. Is there a way to force the normal template, which seems to be the source of the problem, to remain unaltered unless I alter it? Well, unless you can set file permissions on the the dot file, um, and I believe that you can, I'm sure that I wouldn't know exactly how to tell you what to do, but it seems to me there's a way of setting permissions on that file so that you can't be altered by anybody but you. Hmm. And that's the uh, normal dot, dot template. And or you could have something that simply restores the normal dot dot template every time. You know, a new day once an hour or something like that, if it need be. That's kind of blunt force and silly, but that would certainly work. Yeah, maybe I'm just missing something here, but like what I've used a template that had macros long time ago, past life. Um, if I made modifications to that, my first step would be to save it under an original file name or a, under a, a new template name so that it wouldn't be mixed up with the original template. Is there something on the system that's pushing changes back to that standardized template? So wouldn't renaming it then put that defense in place? It would make it yours by being original? Well, if I'm understanding what he's saying here, that's that's words startup. It looks for you know a, a specific template to start up with. You can customize this to suit whatever you want. Um, what he wants to do is to not have those customizations put in by people thinking, oh, okay, well this would make my life simpler, so I'm going to change this particular feature of the template so that it automatically comes up. I don't know whatever way he happens to want it to and well okay so the next person that comes along or anybody else that's familiar with word that's just simply not going to work the same or in this case what's happening is he's he's losing his macros and things like that because someone i would guess from the way he's written goes in and changes the template 
it's yeah. about the only way to prevent that, and that's just what word starts up with. And I don't know that you can tell word to. St- well, see, I was reading this thing, a little bit can, differently. I'm saying you can start word with a template that you choose. I believe. See, I think it's one thing to be able to stop people from changing a template that you've modified and created. That's one problem. So I'm confused by macros being lost every time the computer shuts down or the file is closed. Yeah, there is that. That's a different problem. That sounds sounds more like a... more like an install or, or a damage or something's not happy with Word. Yeah, so if you rename that, rename that, you know, I, I don't know if that solves it or not. If you still are losing it, you know, after that, there's something more fundamental going on. That's a, I hate to say it, a support ticket. Yeah. Yeah, because I've never seen. Uh, and it's Word 365, so it's, it's, it's the cloud version of that as well. Yeah, you know, maybe it's just something that's happening around it that you and I just don't understand about it we're just yeah. not up to date on i would agree with that yeah but that that doesn't sound like healthy system i would involve microsoft so they can look kind of under the covers and see if there's something going on with your profile or with your uh with your license with your uh with your tenant for that yeah. environment so yeah yeah and again i was Thinking of the local versions because that, that's that's where I always start with the right. uh, involved. I do for Word as well. Been. It's yeah. It's uh, I think of the local client before I think of the online. Yep, agreed. And so that would be a good specification for him is to let us know whether that is the online version of Word or the desktop version of Word because yep. they are different. Yep, and I'm assuming he's saying Word three six five that that's the cloud version. Yeah. Okay. All right, so the last one, I don't know if either one of us will be able to provide much of much an answer. Are you much of a Power BI person? Uh, no, unfortunately, not yet. Yeah, I think we're gonna, I'm gonna hold this one off until uh, till we get the bigger crowd in. I, I, I know that I, I don't know the answers here. I think this is something that you know Mike would have an answer for too, because it's getting in and talking about um, Azure SQL, you know, or the storage methods and mm. recommendations there. So. Yeah, but it's all right. We're we're just about at time anyway. So, uh, you know, indeed. Thank you, Hal, for your time again Monday, and thank you everybody for watching. As I said earlier on, uh, if you uh, uh, are interested, we'll be back next Monday at the same time. We're always live at 8 a.m. Pacific uh, every Monday, and we'll have another somewhere between 15 and 25 questions from the community, and we pull. I pull most of them from. The, the Facebook uh, groups, um, the Microsoft 365 SharePoint and Teams groups, and as the Azure groups as well. Um, so those are run by the uh, the Collaborus uh, team. Uh, and so that's where I get a lot of these questions. I also pull from the uh, Microsoft tech community unanswered questions on occasion. Um, but we'll be back next Monday. Uh, of course, the recording will be pushed out to the uh, Collab Talk profile out on YouTube, and it will also have a listing of every question with timestamps for each one, so you don't have to wade through all 90 minutes to jump to the question that you want to hear more about. You'll be able to just go click on the list, jump right to that point in time. And you can also find this episode and all past episodes out on buckleyplanet.com, and I should have that up today or tomorrow. Uh, so with that, yeah. Hal... Thanks a lot. And to sign off for You're Mike welcome. and Eric, and we'll see you next week. Absolutely. With bells on. And I, I guess I'll kick off the music to uh, start up again. So we'll see you later. Okay. Take care.
sky gazing far into the night. I raise my hand to the fire, but it's no use, cause you can't stop it from shining through. It's true, baby, let the light shine through. If you believe it's true, baby, won't you let the light shine through? 